Hello and welcome to Man's Model Moments. First of all, let me state for the record that I like Airfix. I think they're doing a lot of things right, and the people in the Airfix team themselves are great people. So everything I say in this video is in the spirit of the critical friend. If you're not familiar with that concept, it's someone you know and has your best interests at heart, and is enough of a friend to tell you when you're about to do something stupid. Think of telling your married friend who's had one too many at the bar that he really shouldn't be flirting with a hot blonde because he loves his wife and children and he doesn't want to mess that up. That kind of thing. With that intent established, it was a while ago when I posted this video asking if Airfix were the best model company in the world. Despite asking it as a question and giving some reasons I thought they were heading on the right path, some people seemed angry at me even suggesting the possibility. I'm sure there will be people who are equally angry thinking I'm dragging Airfix down here, but in fact neither of these is the case. I want Airfix to address some or all of these issues so they can be even more successful than they've been in the past few years and give us even more great kits. I also say all of this as a consumer, a current retailer, and a former businessman with 30 years of business to business experience, including being a European sales team leader, an international distribution manager, and even Chief Commercial Officer, so I do have some credentials to be able to back up the hyperbole here. Ok, enough preamble, let's get into the meat of it. I'm going to be working from 10 to 1 here, going from the most trivial issues and gradually working up to the things that I believe are truly holding Airfix back. Easy to say, but if they want to compete with others and expand their market presence, they need to be consistent and silence the naysayers. This is hard to do when silly little mistakes crop through the design process and end up in the finished product. There are plenty of recent examples of this as well. The Black Buck Vulcan Pylon, the Union Flag on the Ferret, all of which don't do the current design team justice. Now all manufacturers do make mistakes, but these could have so easily been avoided, and again, if they want to establish themselves as the best, they need to clamp down on these. Now I love the concept of flying hours, but as I said in my former video, which I'll link above if you've not seen, these are not great value, especially bearing in mind that they're only of any value to Airfix Club members since you need to be one to redeem them. In addition to that, they are also still linked to physical things. You need to cut out your flying hours and post them to Airfix, which is very 1960s. You also still need to pay postage on the kits that you get, making a lot of the options financially pointless. Now I did mention in my video ways that these could be changed, but for example a unique QR code inside the box which could be scanned and give you Hornby points on your account would be a much cheaper and easier option than what is currently on offer and broaden their appeal outside of the UK. The Airfix Club is another concept that I want to like, but it's actually pretty poorly executed. Again, like many things in this list, it really only works in the UK. For example, the kit is only supplied in the UK. Why? I get that regional shipping makes it prohibitive to do it from the UK, but why not use local distributors? If retailers were able to supply these on Airfix's behalf, with Airfix covering the local postage from the club fee, you'd expand the reach and membership of the club beyond the UK shores. You'd also give your distributor a new potential customer, strengthening that relationship. The main benefit is also the 10% discount in the store, which again is most useful within the UK. It also brings Airfix into direct competition with its own distributors, and I'll come back to that later. Flying hours, as already discussed, are not the perk that people think of them as, and the other benefits are relatively minor and, in my honest opinion, aimed at a younger audience. Whilst that's absolutely fine, I don't know if Airfix truly understands its customer demographics. Are most club members under 30? I'd guess not. Ugh, the Airfix outlet sales. Don't get me wrong, I've bought some bits from these before, but even when I have, i felt some of the following, and I mainly bought the things I did to cover on the channel, such as the Blood Red Sky set that I wouldn't have bought normally. Firstly, I think that any sort of outlet sale feels a bit desperate. I think it devalues both existing and future offerings. A really good example of this is the game I just mentioned that I bought. It felt very much like Airfix couldn't shift them, so they slashed the price to shift product that wasn't selling, not making it feel very current or valued. 
Another example is the Vulcan being sold for around £40, with the next week the Vulcan Black Book coming out for almost double that at £72.49 with just a single set of extras for the pylons and stores and a specific set of decals. The Vulcan then went back to full price, and that does devalue the whole proposition. The other point on the outlet is that it's not available for retailers. In fact, in many cases, I can buy product from the outlet store cheaper than trade price from Hornby, which both crashes the value of any pre-purchased stock I have and makes me feel like an idiot for buying it. Again, I'll come back to that later. This also creates an impression of overstock or unwanted products, which can create an image or rumour of the company struggling or being in financial trouble, which again isn't the impression that anybody wants. The FX web store is again very UK focused. Are you seeing a trend here? It offers free postage with orders over £30, but only within the UK. A postage outside of the UK is, well, let's say harsh. You're likely to pay 25-30% to more for a kit in the EU from Airfix than you can buy a kit locally for. And even buying from a local retailer, you're likely paying about 30-40% to more than I can buy the same Airfix kit, including postage, in the UK. If I bought a kit in Europe from Airfix compared to what I can buy that kit for in the UK from a retailer, I'm likely paying a 50-80% to premium on it, so not a great site for those outside the UK. The Airfix Club discount is applied before postage, so you can end up paying more as a club member. This is an odd peculiarity of the web store, and it only applies if you're buying in a narrow band, so it's not really a problem, but this also applies to Hornby Hobby Points which again are applied before the shipping calculation, which means if you buy a £36 model and have 700 hobby points, you'll get below the free postage threshold and therefore will be charged postage, practically negating your points. It's a small thing, but it just feels like that this hasn't been properly thought about. Again, shipping to other countries is expensive, which I understand because shipping is a bit crazy at the moment, especially with the UK no longer being in the EU, but then I think Airfix have to look at what the shop is for. If it becomes cost prohibitive outside of the UK, then is it really just for the UK market? And what does that mean for their intents for their addressing this market? Which brings me finally to the store competing directly with their own distribution network. I get that they will be making more money direct, but they need to balance this with how they're supporting the people that sell their kits across the UK. Airfix's customer care is actually Hornby customer care. The same team works for all brands, so there is going to be some lack of knowledge compared to a dedicated Airfix team. That means that any given experience can be good or bad depending on exactly who you get, what your problem is, and so on. Which I understand, but consistency in experience is what customers value. Providing that is positive, of course. I've experienced this myself, with different experiences at different times, and I know I'm not alone from people on the channel who have also reported variable experiences too. Now obviously this needs improving, as QC issues do mean that there are problems out in the field that puts demands on these people. The more issues generated, the more resource you need to invest in customer care to ensure that your customers are happy, otherwise your PR spend is worth nothing. Of course, if the QC issues go away, then there are less issues and this becomes less important, and again, I'll come back to that later. Now I've alluded to this several times already, but the UK focus I'd like to take in two parts. One is the subject focus, and the other is the market focus. So in terms of subjects, Airfix is a UK brand, and Hornby is a UK company, so a natural focus on British subjects does make sense, but this has to be balanced. Even as a Brit, I do get a bit fatigued by this. There is definitely a risk of Airfix becoming typecast as just doing British subjects. Now it's not true, but there are plenty of people out there that already feel that way. In addition, despite that UK focus, some iconic British aircraft have not been recently revisited. Subjects like the TSR2, the English Electric Lightning, the Jaguar, the Tornado and Harrier are all due for some extra love, especially in the 148th arena. Now it's not like there aren't interesting subjects that have broader appeal across countries in modelling fraternities that aren't well represented or wouldn't be welcome from a UK manufacturer. 
For example, the Chinese J-20 stealth aircraft is an interesting subject to many. It has several variants that could extend release possibilities, and it's only injection moulded by Trumpeter, Bronco and Dream model in 172nd scale, and by Trumpeter and Meng model in 148th. Or how about the F-35, which Airfix has already made as a starter kit, but I'd love to see a more broadly appealing version as a full kit. It's been bought all over the world, and differences are basically in the markings, so that's easy to do. Or how about a B-2 in 1144th scale, or even 172nd? There are very few remaining kits out there, and they mostly date back to the early 1990s, and it would be great as a forerunner to a B-21 Raider kit. Alternatively, the XQ-58A Valkyrie drone currently has no models available for it, and yet is probably going to be one of the most important milestones in military aviation history. Likewise, the upcoming Tempest 6th generation aircraft is an indigenous and European aircraft, which could have many possibilities in the future. If armour is more your thing, how about a Challenger 2? This could be released in a large number of variants, including as the Challenger 3, which is mainly a change to the gun and addition of active defence systems. Or how about a T-14 Armata, T-90, T-80 or T-72 that's not made in Russia or China? I mean, T-72s were pretty ubiquitous all over the place, and I'm sure many modellers in North America and Europe would be keen to do some of these without funding regimes they might not fully see eye to eye with. Otherwise, why not extend the collaboration with Academy to release their K2 Black Panther, or some of their other interesting subjects? I think good renditions of multinational subjects would boost general appeal of Airfix, especially in certain markets, which is a good segue into that subject. So if we think about modelling and potential markets, you could make some general assumptions. If we arbitrarily say that 1% of the male population are modellers, and yes, there are female modellers, but the hobby is demographically dominated by men, so for maths purposes, this is a good general yardstick. That means the UK has a potential market of about 340,000 people, making it one of the smallest markets globally. Using the same proportion of other Western markets, this leads us to a European market of 2.6 million, a North American market of 1.9 million, and an Australasian market of 160,000. Looking at East Asia, the upper quartile here has the most wealth, so we'll further divide that market by four to get a rough equivalent to Western nations. As this is a luxury hobby, that's why I've excluded emerging markets like Africa and Southern Asia. That still gives us a potential market of 2.08 million, mostly in China, Japan and South Korea. Now obviously there are many aircraft in Airfix's infantry that have been or are used in these territories already, so making them appealing for these markets could be as simple as a new set of decals. But in any case, remember these figures since I'll come back to them again in the number one point. So in summary here, Airfix need to think about how they become more broadly appealing to other, much larger markets. I think the easiest way to do this is in decal schemes especially in Europe, where many countries use the same or similar aircraft, the Tornado and the Eurofighter being obvious examples. There are other things that play into this here, and I'll come back into this theme again later. Now getting products into the hands of customers is the blood supply that sustains any business. If customers can't easily get products, then you can't access their money. For most manufacturers, this is formed by their network of distributors and retail outlets. As I've already mentioned, this is made harder in Airfix's case in the UK, since Airfix supply directly, including through their Outlook store, which offers prices no distributor can compete with. Even putting these caveats aside, there are some outstanding issues with distributing Airfix products in the UK. For a UK manufacturer, Hornby products have the lowest margin of any of my suppliers. The same or even less than Tamiya, which is through a wholesaler, or Ravel, which is in the EU. So right off the bat, what you see on the shelves in my shop, and others like it, is mostly Airfix's money. In addition, to place an order with Hornby, there is no online portal like I have access to for any other supplier. I have to wait until a Friday when the new stock list is issued to see if things are in stock and when they're expected, and then fill in a form and email that to my rep for placement. So the business practices are very 1990s in dealing with their distributors. In contrast, for most of the suppliers, I can see what's available in real time and simply order through their trade website. 
In order to stock product when you're starting out as a new business, you also need to pay up front, which is hard to do when you're getting started as everything is an investment. Transitioning to a credit account helps with cash flow. This allows you to sell some of the product before paying the invoice for it, helping with that process. Unfortunately, Hornby's credit account is restricted until after six pro forma invoice orders, which all have minimum order values, of course, which is understandable in terms of a general principle. You want to make sure a retailer is legitimate before extending credit terms, but this is double the number required by any other supplier. It's also not in their terms and conditions, but rather just a Hornby policy. Again, making it harder to do business with Airfix. Going back to my former point about what you see on the shelves of a shop mainly being Airfix's money, it's also money they already have. Airfix have also started a trial program of preferential treatment of certain distributors. For me, this is a bit of a killer. Accepting direct competition from your supplier is one thing, but then having to deal with other suppliers who Airfix give a head start to is really loading on the pain. If I don't know about an upcoming release, such as that on the recent hovercraft, I can't plan for it, nor order product until it's announced by Airfix. If other distributors are announcing it at the same time, or even before Airfix, that has several effects. Firstly, I feel like a chump. It tells me Airfix don't really care about my business, or at least not as much as they do about a bigger supplier, who of course is already on credit terms, so has an easier time of things anyway. Secondly, I'm playing catch up. Airfix and the other distributors already have ordering pages ready to go and can take pre-orders straight away. I have to create all of that after the event, and so I'm not going to get those pre-orders. Even if I do pre-order at the earliest time I can, I may not even get product. As of writing this, I still don't have the bond bugs that I pre-ordered, because by the time they got to me, all the stock had already been allocated to direct pre-orders and those from other online outlets who ordered more, obviously on credit. This once again makes me feel like the third man. Now when I was a distributor manager, one of the easiest ways to get people to convert to you as a supplier was to make business easy for them. Make them feel like their business is important to you and that you matter. It's not easy to do business with Hornby and I don't get that warm fuzzy feeling from dealing with them. It's also not just how business is done in these circles. I always get a phone call from one of my suppliers whenever I place an order to confirm everything and inform me of any issues, and also to give me the discounted amount to pay if I pay the performer by backs within a week of the order. I get no such discount from Hornby, in case you're wondering, by the way. One of my suppliers watched Airfix and Chill, and we spent about 30 minutes chatting, including him giving me some insights that I could share with the gang another time. Now I've mentioned this on several other videos, including the aforementioned Is Airfix the Best Model Company in the World video. Airfix really need to pick this one up quickly, I feel, because they're developing a bit of a reputation of Airfix are good kits, providing you get a good one. Now that's not a great place to be. Tamiya have developed their reputation through unmatched consistency. I've never personally had a Tamiya kit which has been missing pieces or has had production issues. Now I'm sure that they exist, but the issue here is prevalence. At the moment, Airfix's main production site is in India, in a factory that also produces injection moulding for Hasbro. Now Hasbro has about four times the turnover of Hornby, and Airfix don't represent the entirety of that revenue, so you can guess where the focus of the production company is going to be, and it's not good for Airfix. Sadly, this does show in a lot of their recent releases, the Seeking, the Bondbug, and many others. Great design, lovely detail, and sharp moulding mean little if what you get is short shot, scratched, warped, missing parts, or so on. Even so, I still think this is secondary to the top thing Airfix need to sort out. This is a particular bugbear for me, since I talk to a lot of international folks and I've managed international distribution as a job before, so to see it done wrong in something that I love is painful. So let's have a look at what is wrong. Firstly, prices in other countries tend to be much higher than in the UK. As an example, a locally sold kit in Europe is likely to be 25-30% more than I can buy it as a customer in the UK. That 25-30% means that Airfix products are often the same or uncompetitive with manufacturers such as Tamiya. It's no good designing a product for a particular price point only to see that elevated in different markets, meaning your original value proposition is no longer valid. People already argue that Tamiya's value proposition is better than Airfix's in the UK, with a 20% higher price on average. 
so at equivalence, Airfix's position is completely eroded. Aside from price, lead times on new products are often prohibited, unless you're going to bite the bullet on direct shipping from Airfix. Even so, sometimes product is simply not available, which means there isn't even a space for Airfix to try to establish themselves. I've had messages from people in East Asia who say that product is really available, and when it is, the price is all over the place, so they just don't bother. So in summary, I think Airfix are at that awkward stage in a company's development, those sort of teenage years, where they're too big to produce niche products of a few specialised subjects and work with a limited return, and too small to really compete well with the big established companies like Tamiya and some of the newer, rapidly growing Chinese companies as well. When you're a small company, people are likely to cut you more slack, and we've seen that that is not the case with Airfix. They've done some great things over the past decade, but they've also been very UK focused, which is great if you live here, but not so much if you don't, especially post Brexit, which has seen European shipping become more expensive and bureaucratic. I see this a lot when I make a YouTube video on a subject and talk about price or value and get comments from other places in the world that tell me just how much that particular kit is in their region. In any case, I hope Airfix do tackle some of these things in the coming months and years, because without consistent QC and a more global focus, I think they're limiting their potential and risk setting themselves in a British manufacturer for British subjects in Britain kind of shoebox, which I don't think is where they imagine themselves to be in 5-10 years, and I don't think it's what any of us really want. That's all for this instalment of Man's Model Moments. If you enjoyed the video, please click the like button, subscribe to the channel for more like it, and share this video with others you think would also enjoy it. You can also follow me on Instagram, Twitter and Facebook, and if you're feeling generous then I also have a Patreon, which is absolutely the best way of helping me to grow the channel and produce more content like this. With that, I hope you have plenty of modelling moments of your own, and I look forward to welcoming you on the next video.